first story that I wanted to mention was uh, just Joe Biden immigration story. And apparently uh, nobody's really happy about this. So there were new ICE guidelines that sort of are being uh, categorized as an entire backtrack of the Biden administration. So let's take a look at this article over from lawandcrime.com. It says this new guidance is a complete backtrack from a 100-day deportation moratorium that was promised, and it expands enforcement priorities. Now, I want to just point out a little bit of a high-level observation here. So I want, uh, you know, this is from a website called lawandcrime.com. You know, we, we, I read a lot of them, and I think they tend to sort of lean to the left a little bit, like a lot of publications in the law do. Nothing wrong with that. And so I try to read from a number of different sources. But when you see something that is typically left-leaning that comes out and is also upset about it, then you know it's kind of a big issue. And we're going to compare and contrast this story, or the, 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 some of the information that we're going through here. We're going to have reaction from the ACLU. We're going to go through um, some sp uh, specific statements. We're going to look back at the Nevada caucuses. But I want to show you this sort of characterization of this versus the Washington Post. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to go through both of them, the same story. Or the, or the same the same incident, right? ICE guidelines that are being released from the Biden administration. We just want to look at how different news agencies are reporting on it. What lens are they applying to the facts of the case? So we're going to start with lawandcrime.com, and then we're going to save the Washington Post for the end. All right, so once again, the Biden administration has deported several several hundred immigrants since taking power over the federal government. Those deportations are ongoing. On Thursday, the Department of Homeland Security formally backtracked from President Joe Biden's pledge to halt deportations during his first 100 days in office. ICE, Acting ICE Director Tay Johnson told ICE employees on Thursday that recently confirmed DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas would issue new enforcement guidelines within the next 90 days, quote, after consultation with department personnel and external stakeholders. So those guidelines came out now, and Thursday's guidance solidifies deportation discretion granted by the administration to ICE and significantly expands the agency's ability to effectuate detentions and deportations. And so you're going to see, right, th their summary of this. Where everybody's looking at the same guidance. It's the same document that came out. And so you're seeing how it's being interpreted, right? And this is where you get, you know, this is where lawyers make their money. It's, it's in this gray area trying to interpret things. But this is also where journalists make their money. They are sort of taking the same story and putting their own spin on it. And so you can just keep that in mind as we're analyzing both of these. So it goes on. Under the memo, ICE is directed to focus on three tiers of enforcement and removal priorities. So what justifies the enforcement, the detention, and the removal of the deportation? They're looking at three things. Number one, whether undocumented immigrants who are deemed to be or, or who are being suspected of a national security threat. So number one, if they're a national security threat, then they are priority. Right, they're going to focus on three tiers, three priorities. Number one, national security threats. Makes sense. Number two, undocumented immigrants who entered or attempted to enter the country on or after November 1st, 2020. What? Wait a minute. So you're saying that before he was president, he's going to sort of retroactively go back. So Joe Biden didn't get into office until January 20th. Right. That was the, the inauguration day. And now we're going all the way back to November 1st. And he's saying anybody who came in. You all got to go. Anybody who came in after November 1st, you got to go. Well, that's a little bit different than what he was saying previously about a moratorium. Right. So you could you could understand why a lot of people from south of the border or from any one of the borders would come across to be with their families or to sort of respond to Joe Biden and his promise that there will not be any deportations. So they sort of relied upon his statement. They relied upon what he promised during the campaigns. Now that's being flipped around a little bit. And so this doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of not even a commentary on immigration, whether you want to call it illegal immigration or undocumented migration or however you want to categorize it. This is not even about that. This is about a politician promising something and delivering something else. So that's in the guidance undocumented immigrants who entered or attempted to enter the country on or after November 1st, they are also priority. So same thing as a national security threat. They also get priority status. And then number three, undocumented immigrants convicted of certain felony and gang related offenses. And we're going to dive into this a little bit further. 
here in a second. There are a few key differences between Biden's enforcement priorities and those under Obama's, whereas Biden's crime-focused deportation guidance, priority number three, we're talking about this one here, number three, felony and gang-related offenses, it calls for deportation of those with, quote, aggravated felonies. It's a broad uh, suite of crimes broad suit of crimes uh, in the context of non-U.S. citizens. Obama called for the deportation of people with a, quote, significant misdemeanor as the baseline. So it says it says here, we're, I'm going to explain this here in a minute, but it says still immigration rights advocates and activists are livid about the face, uh, about the about face of the nation Biden administration. So what you're what we're talking about here is traditionally in most states, there are kind of three categories of crime, sometimes four. You can call them kind of petty crimes or civil crimes. Those are sort of the bottom tier crimes. Civil crimes would be like a traffic ticket, right? You get pulled over for speeding. It's a civil ticket. You're not going to jail for that. Then you have a next sort of mid tier level of crimes that are called misdemeanors. In Arizona, we have three tiers of misdemeanors. Some states, you know, they have more tiers than that. Some states, they don't have civil tickets. They only have misdemeanors. But in Arizona, it kind of goes civil misdemeanor offenses and then your serious felony offenses. All right. So what this article is saying is under Obama's immigration policy, there was deportation for a significant misdemeanor. Right. So the line was kind of lower. Right. If you if you cross this line, this misdemeanor line, then you're going to be eligible for deportation. And so in Arizona, the way that this is structured is the, the more serious misdemeanors. We have three categories of offenses, class three, two and one. Three is the least serious. One is the most serious. And in Arizona, the least serious crimes, those are they're still crimes. You can still go to jail for them. They are still misdemeanor offenses. But for example, we have what's called criminal speeding here. If you're going over 85 miles per hour anywhere in the state, you're going to get charged with a misdemeanor. You could go to jail for 30 days. Not likely, but you could under our laws. So would that be a significant misdemeanor under Arizona law under Barack Obama's plan? Probably not, right? Criminal speeding probably would not. It's a class three. It's the lowest tier that we've got. But if you were also charged with a misdemeanor, let's say for a DUI or for domestic violence, those are going to be class one misdemeanors. And so those are more likely to be a significant misdemeanor because they're higher up on the on the tier. And in Arizona, class one misdemeanors, there are, there are those offenses. They're DUIs, domestic violence, uh, some levels of assaults and so on. Some of the more serious crimes, but they're not felonies. Okay, felonies are sort of a whole different category. When you're talking about misdemeanors, like Obama was saying, that was where we're drawing the line. Those are typically prison, I'm sorry, not prison offenses. Those are jail offenses. When you get up into the felony tier, that's when you go to prison. And there's a pretty big difference. Prison is more, it's longer term. You're, you're convicted of a felony. So therefore you lose your right to vote. You lose your right to possess a firearm. You lose your right to certain federal benefits. And the list goes on and on. Felony is a whole different category. Now you're talking about certain offenses like, you know, certainly sexual assault. We're talking about some serious drug crimes like possession of narcotic drugs, dangerous drugs. Up until very recently, it was even marijuana charges here in the state of Arizona. And so it's kind of a whole different category. And so what happened here under Biden's plan is he changed that line a little bit. So it went from if you are convicted of a significant misdemeanor under Obama's plan, that makes you eligible for detention and deportation. But Joe Biden raised that line. So now under his plan, you can still technically, according to this article, you still can commit a significant misdemeanor and you're still in the clear because they raised the line up to the felony standard. And now they're talking about aggravated felonies. And so, you know, I'm not real sure what that interpretation is going to mean. I don't know if it's only for aggravated felonies. So, for example, we have what's called aggravated assault, which is, let's say you're choking somebody and you restrict their airway. If you hit somebody in the head with, let's say, an open hand and they're not particularly injured, that would be a regular assault misdemeanor level. But if you are now choking somebody, it's going to make it an aggravated assault because you have an aggravating factor in there. So is that what they're talking about? Just aggravated types of offenses. We also have aggravated uh, DUIs. If it's a third offense, there are other reasons you can get it. You, you could also have aggravated domestic violence. But what about sexual assault? Is that an aggravated crime? Well, you Technically, I mean, you could, if you use the sort of layperson definition of aggravated, yeah, it's a pretty serious type of offense, but it's technically not aggravated. So are they only talking about the, the legal designation of aggravated or are they defining that to be stuff that is a more higher level felony? So some ambiguity there, but the point here is that the line is changing. It's going from 
we were going to detain you and deport you for significant misdemeanors to now saying significant misdemeanors are okay. Now the, the standard is much higher for an aggravated felony. So we'll see what that means since it, this is now the new guidance. It says the memo is disappointing. It is a disappointing step back backward from the Biden administration earlier comments to fully break from the harmful deportation policies of both the Trump and Obama presidencies. This came from American Civil Liberties Union Senior Advocacy and Policy Council Noreen Shaw. She said, we expect better from the Biden administration. We believe this memo only makes it easier for ICE to detain and deport immigrants. A clear backtrack from President Joe Biden's campaign promises and earlier executive orders. Uh, said races, the largest immigration legal services nonprofit in Texas. So we got two quotes, one from the ACLU, one from races. And they're both saying this is a this is not this is not in alignment with his campaign promises. It's a clear backtrack and they expect better from the Biden administration. So let's we're going to continue to go through it. And then we're going to go back to what Joe Biden said, because, you know, did, did he really promise this? Is this really something that he said on the campaign trail? People say a lot of things. But was he unequivocal about this? So let's take a look. Under the new guidance, ICE agents are on alert that, quote, no pre-approval is required for presumed priority cases. So what does this mean? So well, they explain it. Here we go. Perfect. I was just going to explain it, but they got it for me. It says here. So if any undocumented immigrants fall into any of the three above noted enforcement priority groupings, ICE agents and officers need not obtain pre-approval for enforcement or removal actions that meet the outline criteria beyond what the existing policy requires and what a supervisor instructs. This means that ICE agents do, in fact, have the authority to pursue non-priority cases that fall outside of the three main categories, but such enforcement and deportations must be signed off on by a superior. The guideline also offers exceptions to the pre-approval guidelines for exigent circumstances and demands of public safety, which are left undefined in the memo. Additional caveats for ICE agents include the ability to conduct the enforcement action and then request approval within 24 hours of following the action. So long story short, we've got those three different definitions that are priority cases. If you're a national security threat, if you are somebody who committed an aggravated felony, if you are somebody who came to this country after November 1st, 2020, then you are in one of those categories and you are subject to sort of this immediate fast track detention removal process. But if you're not in that category, then basically what you need to do is you got to go and you got to uh, ask that a supervisor sign off on some of this stuff. Unless there are exigent circumstances, there are public safety exceptions, or there's, uh, it sounds like there's other additional caveats there. So a lot of leeway to, to sort of make decisions that are outside of those three categories. And that is largely what they are unhappy about. So we have, first of all, three huge buckets of detain and deport. And then we've got a lot of ambiguity in some alternative circuitous routes where they can still conduct detentions and deportations. Going on, it says here, Biden first promised to halt all these deportations during his first 100 days in office during a CNN town hall just before the Nevada caucuses. This is what he said. We have a right to protect the border. But the idea, and by the way, nobody, and some of you are going to get mad at me with this, but nobody is going to be deported in my first 100 days until we get through the point that we find out the only rationale for deportation will be whether or not, whether or not you've committed a felony while in the country. So, uh, he reiterated his support for this moratorium during a March 2020 primary debate between him and Bernie Sanders. August 2020, campaign spokesman Andrew Bates told The Intercept's Aida Chavez that the moratorium, quote, absolutely remains his position and will not change at any point. Oh, but that position actually changed immediately upon taking office. The actual text of the memo authorized by authored by then acting DHS Secretary David Pakoski was a far cry from Biden's campaign promise. And here it is. February 18th, this came out yesterday, late yesterday, as we can see from the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Memorandum for All ICE Employees. So it's going out to everybody who's a part of Immigration and Customs Enforcement from Tay D. Johnson, the acting director, subject interim guidance, civil immigration enforcement, and removal priorities. So they're defining what the priorities are. I'm not going to spend the whole time reading through all of this, but I just want to show you kind of what it looks like. This memorandum establishes interim guidance in support of the interim civil immigration enforcement and removal priorities. 
that Acting Secretary Peskovsky issued on January 20th. It's effective immediately, applies to all U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement directorates and program offices, covers everything, enforcement actions, custody decisions, execution of final orders, final expenditures, uh, strategic planning, and on and on and on. It's going to remain in effect until the new secretary issues new enforcement. They're going to issue new guidelines only after consultation with leadership and the workforce of ICE. So uh, he anticipates issuing these guidelines in less than 90 days. So, well, first of all, we'll see if this is uh, sort of fast tracked, right? So maybe this is the opening offer and they're going to go and very quickly meet with leadership and workforce to determine that suddenly they can sort of uh, fudge around the edges a little bit. But it sounds like they're also meeting with specifically DHS, ICE and U.S. Customs and Border Protection. So if you do meet with those agencies, of course, they're going to say, yeah, I mean, if what we're doing is probably pretty good. Right. We got to actually enforce the border because we are part of a uh, Customs and Border Protection. So that's kind of our job description. So yes, we need to continue doing these things. And, you know, it'll be it'll be very curious to see if they give them some of these authorities and then suddenly turn around and take them back sort of after this public outcry, after the ACLU is upset with them, after races is upset with them. You're going to see a lot of other, uh, you know, major major groups that come out and they just say, nope, not too happy about this, Joe. Here, this uh, memorandum goes on. I have requested approval of certain revisions to the interim member until we have new enforcement guidelines. Here's what we've got. You'll read below. Authorization to apprehend presumed priority non-citizens at large enforcement actions without advance approval. So if they can just go, go get them. Uh, the revisions, as you'll read below, the revisions include, but are not limited to that. You can also look at all these things. Uh, we've got number two, inclusion of criminal gangs and transnational criminal organizations as presumed priorities, authorization to append without prior approval for presumed priority non-citizens, how to evaluate whether a non-citizen who is presumed, who is not a presumed priority, nevertheless poses a public safety threat and should be apprehended, further delegation of approval authority, the importance of providing advance notice of at-large enforcement actions to state and local law enforcement. So a lot of room in there to go and enforce uh, detention and removal orders. We've got some background they go through. Joe Biden issued an executive order on January 20th that articulated the baseline values and priorities for enforcement. Then they started conducting their reviews. There were a third it instituted. Let's see here. Third it instituted a hundred day pause on certain removals pending the review. Then it rescinded several existing policy memoranda. The interim memo further directed ICE issue interim guidance implementing the revised enforcement priorities and the removal pause. Hmm. January 26, Southern District issued a temporary restraining order enjoining the department from enforcing and implementing the 100-day removal pause. So the federal district court from Texas, so they, they originally started, it instituted a 100-day pause. The U.S. District Court out of Texas said, nope, you can't do that. Like other national security and public safety agencies, ICE operates in an environment of limited resources. Due to these limited resources, ICE has always prioritized and necessarily must prioritize certain enforcement and removal actions. In addition to this, these factors include ongoing litigation. We've got COVID-19 issues. We've got relationships with sovereign nations and on and on and on. Okay, accordingly, in executing its critical national security, border security, and public safety mission, the department must exercise its well-established prosecutorial discretion and make priorities. So this is then where we get those three priorities uh, for individuals who can be detained and removed. We've got engaging in terrorism, engaging in espionage, engaging, I'm sorry, apprehension of arrest. So we've got some other actual priorities. This is the national security category. Then we're going to get over to the border security category. If they were ap apprehended on or after November 1st, 2020, then they are uh, going to be detained and removed. If he or she was not physically present before November 1st. So I'm going to guess that's a pretty big category of people. Public safety. Also, if it's an aggravated felony as defined in Section 101A43. So apparently they got a list of those. I've not seen that. He or she has been convicted of an offense that involved a criminal street gang. So this is modifying all of that. No pre-approval required for presumed priority cases. Officers and agents need not obtain pre-approval for enforcement or removal actions that meet the above criteria for presumed priority cases beyond what the existing policy requires and what a supervisor instructs. So it's just follow the policies, right? So they have a ton of discretion. As long as it fits within one of those categories, then they can go and just initiate proceedings and 
detain and remove individuals who are not citizens of this country. Now, the ACLU is not happy about it. And I saw this this morning and then I got into the office today and uh, Nick over here from our office brought this story to my attention as well. And so, uh, you know, it, sort of everybody was looking at this going, what this what how what? This is so opposite of what he said he was going to do. How is this even a thing? And the ACLU is calling that out. Senior Advocacy and Policy Council issued the following statement. This memo is a disappointing step backward for the Biden administration. Earlier commitments to fully break from the harmful policies. We already read that. The interim enforcement priorities detailed today import the injustices of the criminal legal system and will lead to continued disproportionate deportations of black and brown immigrants. Priorities use sweeping and overbroad presumptions of the threat. That have for decades resulted in biased profiling and harmful immigration consequences for black and brown people, including Muslims. The priorities presume that all recent border crossers are threats in total contravention of President Biden's commitment to ensuring that people seeking asylum are treated with dignity. It goes on. We expect better from the Biden administration and believe that the next 90 days will continue to reaffirm the need to force ICE to downscale its operations, including by ending ICE programs that tap state and local law enforcement for immigration enforcement, such as the 287G program and the use of ICE detainers. We demand accountability for the unjust arrests and deportations that ICE officers and their local partners will inflict on immigrant communities until further until DHS further reforms. At a time when black immigrants are being deported, including to the lethal situation in Haiti, the Biden administration must not hesitate to put real limits on ICE as it works to undo the chaos and cruelty of both the Trump and Obama administrations. The Biden administration must fully break from the racist. Oh, and unfair policies of the past. That's pretty close to calling Uncle Joe a racist. They, it, look, if you're not fully breaking from the racist policies of the past, if you're still kind of perpetuating those of the racist Obama policies and the racist Trump policies, then is Uncle Joe a racist now? Oh, boy. Well, according to the ACLU, they are. And the ACLU is not happy about it. Now, as I mentioned, you know, sort of the most one of the most interesting parts of this whole story is how the media is reporting on it. Right. And obviously, it's, it's that's not more interesting than the probably tens of thousands of people who are going to be deported, according to Joe Biden's new orders. But it is still very interesting for somebody who is sort of an outside observer. Uh, we don't do any immigration law here, but there is crossover between, uh, of course, criminal law. Right. If ICE is using local law enforcement to help sort of round people up if they're charging people or if they're stopping people for traffic stops and they check their status and now they're being charged with a crime. Now they're, head in the, they're held in the criminal justice system. And then from there, you know, there's an ICE hold. And so there's a lot of complexities between dealing with the federal government, the ICE program and local jails and local facilities. And you've got, you know, these complicated interfaces and it's it's. It's a tricky sort of minefield when you're trying to navigate some of that stuff. So, uh, you know, this is this is going to, of course, lead to more people getting picked up by the police, more people being held on, in detainers, more people sort of, you know, hanging out in jail cells, waiting for ICE to come and get them. And so this is going to have a, you know, a pretty a pretty big effect throughout the entire country. Obviously, I'm going to guess that there are a lot of people who came across the border, especially after Joe Biden one, after we confirmed that, you know, sort of the, the popular confirmation at the time was after November 3rd, it was looking like Joe Biden was going to be the next president. Now, there was a contingent here in the country that thought, well, maybe not. You know, maybe there's going to be some ongoing litigation and this will flip course at some point in time. But generally speaking, I mean, the, the, the national media, the corporate media in this country and throughout the world was sort of coronating Joe Biden before uh, the electoral votes had been counted and they were presuming that that he was the president, which turned out to be true. So from November 3rd up until today, you would imagine that there were a lot of people who saw that and were listening to his promises that well, there's going to be a moratorium here. You know, we're going to bring back all of the compassionate type of immigration policies that he's been promising through, you know, throughout his campaign. And suddenly not so much, actually, if you're here and you came over here after November 3rd, sorry, you got to get back out of here. So we'll see where that goes. But now we just went through everything, right? We just saw what law and crime reported. We just heard a quote from RACES, R-A-I-C-E-S, which is an organization. We also heard from the ACLU. Not happy about it. But 
when you go over to the new, I'm sorry, the Washington Post, I can't even tell the difference between them folks anymore. The Washington Post, this is what their headline says. Biden memo for ICE officers points to fewer deportations and strict oversight. <laughs> what are you talking about? We just heard from everybody who's on the left, who is really, you know, sort of totally opposed to you know stringent immigration policies coming out and saying this is a ridiculous stringent even racist immigration policy and we're upset about it so the washington post apparently read the same memo and they were the original aclu is upset about it because they're saying well it's, it's racist and they're going to be able to deport a lot of people there's there's uh basically you know, holes that you can drive a truck through that are big enough to justify why somebody would need to be det detained and deported washington post reads the same thing and says no this memo, the way we interpret it, means fewer deportations and actually stricter oversight. So reading the same thing, two totally different takes. U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement officers will need pre-approval from senior manager before trying to deport anyone who is not a recent border crosser, a national security threat, or a criminal offender with an aggravated felony conviction. It's technically true, right? I mean, it is true, but it's just spun a whole different way. Like, this is a great victory to stop de deportations and engage some strict oversight. It goes on, according to the interim enforcement memo by the Biden administration on Thursday, the narrower priorities are expected to result in a steep drop in immigration arrests and deportations. Biden officials said the new guidelines, which will be in effect for the next 90 days, will allow the agency to make better use of its resources while prioritizing public safety threats. Isn't that funny? Uh, look, I mean, I don't have a, I don't have a particular leaning one way on, you know, policy wise, one way or the other on this particular issue. I mean, you know, I, 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 I just want politicians to stay true to their word, right? That's the whole point of this segment. I'm not commenting on uh, the state of our immigration system other than, than to say uh, it's a joke, right? Because we have politicians who are promising things that get them elected and then getting elected and literally doing the opposite of that. ACLU is not happy. Racist is not happy about it. And um, you still have the Washington Post, though. They are reliable, like clockwork, folks. They will spin anything that they possibly can in order to make the current administration look good, as we just saw here. We, we literally were reading through quotes and Joe Biden, his own statements from a from Nevada. But they come out and they just say, oh, fewer deportations and strict oversight. Do you buy that for a minute? We got Aurora's mom says, uh, Aurora's mom, 2021 said, says he hasn't kept any of his promises. I honestly feel bad for Democrats because they believed him. You know, I'm seeing a lot of that. And I just got my hair cut today, by the way. And I was talking to the incredible Amanda and she was saying, uh, you know, we, we were, I was actually making this point to her. I said, well, what about those $2,000 checks that we were supposed to get? Everybody was supposed to get now it's like $1,400 checks. And it also has to be means tested. There was like, it just goes on and on and on. The list is just nonstop. We also, I mean, it just, let's go back to your comment before. I uh, spin off into a tirade. Humanity needs to make a comeback either way. Just because they voted for him doesn't mean they aren't just as upset about certain EOs Biden has authorized, mainly reversing the cap on insulin and EpiPens. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people I think are having buyer's remorse. I mean, the Keystone Pipeline, right? There was there was these unions that came out for Joe and he was promising, uh, you know, we're not going to end fracking. Everything's going to be good. Vote for me, Pennsylvania. They did. First day in office, oh, we're going to ban the Keystone Pipeline. Next day, unions come out. We're very disappointed in Joe. And everybody's going, hey, we, everybody was telling you this, guys. But, uh, you know, so, sorry. I mean, I feel bad for him. I really do. I, I, feel, I feel bad. I do not want people losing their jobs for ridiculous things. But that's just the nature of the, the, of the result of elections. Jeremy Matrita says, during the second presidential debate, Trump said to Biden, he is a politician making empty promises that Biden was the reason Trump even ran for president. And, you know, it's basically that, right? I mean, we're just seeing that sort of line item by line item across the board. And it's it's sad. You know, a lot of people, I think, are getting uh, uh, getting woken up by the fact that you know, they were kind of sold a false bill of goods. We got want to know says which international law states a country cannot protect their borders. A passport is just permission you're allowed to visit. So I'm not sure what international law is, but, you know, the the. United States law says that we have borders and if we have borders, I think that there should be some enforcement of the border. Otherwise, why do we have a border, right? Why do we have a policy? Why do we have a policy at our office to be at your desk on time a certain time? Because it's important that, that we have reasons for that. And if 
we do not enforce that or if people are not abiding by that, then why do we have the policy? In other words, why do we have policies that are not being effectuated? If we have a border, then it should be enforced. If we don't want to enforce the border, then just make it an alternative. Call it whatever you want then at that point. Call it just a, a line of demarcation that anybody's free to come and, and pass through. Aurora's mom says, for sure, I'm saying we can't fault the people who voted for them and show no empathy. We need to come together, Democrat, Republican, everyone. The media is the one pushing the violent narrative. Even suppression is done by the media, not the individuals themselves. I just want to see more empathy and less blame baiting. Aurora's mom, that was beautiful. Very beautiful. I would agree with you, right? We want more unity, just like Joe. Hey, Jeremy Matrita says, I did have a question about what aggravated means when part of an of an, uh, an offense. Oh, so, okay, so did I answer that? So aggravated means there's some sort of aggravating factor. So let's use a DUI example. In Arizona, first DUI is a regular DUI. Second DUI is a second DUI. Third DUI is an aggravated DUI. And the reason it's aggravated is because you got a third, you got a third one. That's the aggravating factor. It's an aggra it's, a, it's a regular DUI with an aggravating factor of two priors. You can also get it if you, let's say you got a DUI, you were supposed to have an intoxilizer in your car, a breath, a breathalyzer from a prior DUI and you get another DUI. Doesn't have to be a third if it's a second offense, but you didn't have the intoxilizer in your car. That's an aggravating factor. That's going to bump it up from a lower level misdemeanor offense up into an aggravated offense. And so aggravation typically means several priors that they'll use to increase the potential penalties on the new charges. Good question. Cody Bear one says, Rob, is there any way to stop Biden before he completely ruins the country? Can we, the people, start a class action or just watch the, the country plumper? Well, Cody Bear, for, first of all, plumper is a hell of a word. I love that word. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing at that. Watch the country plumper. So, you know, I'm hopeful the, the country does not plumper. We cannot sue Biden with the class action. The only thing that you can do is, is you know, get plugged in, you know, and I say this a lot, it's act locally. Stop worrying so much about the federal government. They're 3000 miles away from us. They're probably thousands of miles away from most of you, unless you live right there in that sort of DC bubble, which most of the country does not. So, you know, th there's a lot happening there, but I think the most effective action takes place locally where you can, you know, you can see the effects of your elected people in your face because it's happening in your society. And I think that's where a lot of our efforts should be focused. So, you know, you can't sue the president for a political problem because that's called a political question and the courts will just throw that out. They'll say you have no standing. Your process for uh, filing a grievance against the president is to go vote. It's to get engaged in the political process, not to go file a lawsuit in court. So unfortunately, we are going to have to sort of hold on tight while Biden continues to plumper this country into the depths of plump. We have another one from Jeremy Matrita says the states have the authority to stop con unconstitutional executive orders. Congress has to vote on laws for them to become enacted and federally binding. Yeah. So there, there, there is a lot of nuance there. No question about it, Jeremy. You know, we have a, a system that's called federalism. We've got a federal government and we have state governments and there's they're structured that way for a reason. I think it's one of the most brilliant mechanisms of our constitution. In fact, it's to say that the federal government you got to stay in your hula hoop a little bit. Let the state stay in their hula hoops. Largely, what the Supreme Court has does, done is it really expanded the authority of the federal government through things like the Commerce Clause and through this, the tax and spend powers. So that now, if you're sort of engaged in anything in this world that potentially, even theoretically, crosses state lines, you're sort of now brought within the, the power and the purview of the Commerce Clause, which under the Constitution, the federal government does have the authority to regulate. So that's how they will get into smaller states' issues. You know, if you have a widget and you want to sell a widget on the internet, well, there's a possibility that somebody in California, I'm in Arizona, buys my widget. Now I'm engaged in interstate commerce. Now whatever I'm doing is subject to federal regulation. That's sort of a, a quick and dirty, simplistic analogy. But that's one way that they get their little hooks into you. Now, the other way they do it is through these, the tax and spend power, right? That they, you, you, you are obligated to be taxed. They have jurisdiction over that. It's all, that's why we pay federal income taxes. And they can also spend that. So if you want, you know, if, if you're a, a resident of a, a, a citizen of a state, then 
you've, you're being taxed. And if you want to see any of that money come back to you, then they use the power of the purse. They say, well, you know, we're going to give you this federal benefit. We're going to give you this money back, but it's a contract. Now it's not a mandate from the federal government. We're going to say, we're going to give you Arizona a billion dollars to go build a highway, but we need you to raise your speed limits up to 75 miles an hour, 65, whatever. Right. And that's how they sort of get states to comply with the interstate travel, uh, uh, speed limits and, and little things like that. So they use the power of the purse to mandate what certain, what certain policies are installed in the various states. And because you have to give them your money and you want to see that back, many states and many politicians will comply with the mandates of the federal government. So it, it, there's a lot going on there, but it's a very good thought. We have Sharon says, actually, this is good news. It allays a lot of fears about gang members, criminals, et cetera. I really don't understand about the November one cutoff date though. Yeah, Sharon. So that's one take on it. You know, I think, I think the November one cutoff date, I'm not sure why they did that. They went all the way back to that date for some reason. I don't know. We got cattle caregiver says, why is the ACLU making this a race issue? Black and brown people. Everything's a race issue. Everything. I don't know why they, I don't know, but, but they do everything. We got cattle, cattle caregiver says, man, mainstream media going from bagging on Trump 24 seven to trying to figure out how to walk this tightrope. This will be entertaining. It is entertaining. It's already entertaining. It's probably just going to get more. So thank you for that cattle caregiver. We got Tim MCD says Democrat mantra one, create a crisis Two, never let a crisis go to waste. And we expect that uh, we expected that certainly, uh, I think with COVID, I think a lot of politicians were jumping in and t making, you know, taking maximum advantage of that. We got Ma Fox in the house. What's up, Ma? Why did anyone expect Joe to deviate from Obama's, Obama's policies again? That's a good point, right? I think I was sort of saying that even before the election, like Joe Biden is going to be Obama's third term. And it sounds like he's kind of doing that, right? I think Ma's right on track. We've got Cattle Caregiver, who is citing Cat Turd over here from Twitter. It says, Joe Biden, 52 executive orders in three weeks, zero new laws going through Congress, and Democrats called Trump a dictator. Yeah, I think it is a lot, right? It's sort of, a, it's sort of abnormally a lot of executive orders. I don't know whether it is 52 or not, but I think it was sort of abnormally high. I think if you look, and you know, I don't, uh, tr truthfully, I'm not, I'm not too bent out of shape over the executive order thing. I mean, I think it's probably just really, really rapid fire right now. So, you know, I, I guess my point is certainly I would like things to go through Congress. I think a lot of these executive orders that Trump was doing, that Bush was doing, that Obama was doing are all extra constitutional. These are all sort of powers that really weren't written into the constitution that are delegated to the executive branch. They're just sort of taking uh, what they think is within their purview and they're just codifying certain things that are not really constitutional into the purview of the executive branch through these executive orders. So I'm not really happy with executive orders anyways, but you know, if Joe Biden, let's say, you know, if, if you're, if you're looking at this sort of on a chart, if you're plotting a, a, an, an X axis, a Y axis, and you're saying, okay, the number of executive orders over time, if they go like this, kind of a, a, a moderate slope working their way up, or if they go like this, you know, they may reach the same endpoint. You know, I don't know. I don't know if Joe Biden signed 52 in three weeks. And if he didn't do it in three weeks, he would have done it in six or 10 or 12. I don't know, but he's certainly moving fast. And I think some people are happy about it. I don't know. We have farmer's daughter says you have to do your homework when you vote. My family vote ba voted based on their hate for Trump rather than Biden's policies. Yeah. And I think that was um, very prevalent. Okay. Most people in my life are the same way. People who were, people were very anti-Trump, but they couldn't say almost nothing about Biden. And um, many of them now are going, hmm, this is interesting. I thought that, uh, I thought suddenly that everything would be better. And, and look, it's still early in Biden's administration, right? It's still early, and I'm not saying that he should have walked out and cured COVID, right? It's the same thing. I think Trump got a lot of unfair criticism. People were expecting him to sort of, you know, put on a Superman suit and go out there and cure COVID. It's like, you, know, you can only do so much here. And so Biden deserves that little leeway as well. But when you have something like this that is, that is sort of as plainly contra contrary to what he was promising in the underlying campaign, you can't call him out on that because that that's his decision. He made that decision. And this is the same reason I get really critical about some of the criminal justice reform stuff, right? Stop talking about 
the studies and the and the groups and the commissions that you're going to install to go and really investigate these issues. We've been investigating them, Uncle Joe. You are now the president. You also have the Senate and the House. So why can't you just go and just put a bill in place, cram it through the House? I have not even seen one introduced yet, but you, you signed 52 executive orders or whatever it is. So let's get some movement on that. But I'm not holding my breath. We have, if we don't have border security, then why should we screen people at the airports? They're going to find their way in into one country one way or, the other, uh, or another. The same reason you don't want everybody getting a plane and flying to the America is the same reason you don't want them walking in. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, you know, yes, if, if you have a, a, a government, it's just like anything, right? If you have a building that you own, if you have a home that you own, if you have, uh, you know, a massive property that you own, you kind of want to make sure you know who's coming in and who's not. And so... Uh, Joe Biden agrees. Apparently, he's going to be putting some pretty strong enforcement in there. We've got ham handed says regarding the stimulus checks, the ones passed in December. My wife received hers in January, but mine is scheduled for May 1st. The only difference is that she is a liberal and I'm a conservative. We both live at the same address, sleep in the same bed, have the same last name, have the same birth month. What else can it be? What? Are you serious about that? Ham handed. That's very interesting. That would be curious to understand why that's happening. Very, very good question. Um, all right. Well, we've got one one more on this segment from Nadarb Lassier says, as Scott Adams says, the longer Biden is president, the better Trump will look. Maybe some eyes will be opened. Yeah, I, I firmly agree with that. You know, I, I, I think I said on this show that I think people are going to miss him, right? People are going to miss him. Not, not, not a lot of people. A lot of people are just absolutely repulsed by him. But there are people in this country that were sort of kind of on the eye, on the fence here. And they were expecting this, you know, they were, they were sort of living in this world where Trump was this Hitlerian monster who was just so devastating and destructive. And Joe Biden was going to be just this really competent return to form, return to American excellence, almost like a Barack Obama type of figure, somebody that you sort of just place your hopes into and they just seem aspirational and, I, and sort of idealized version of what a president should be. People were thinking that about Joe and he wasn't really around much during the campaigns to show them any differently. But now that he's in there and now people are seeing him in his performance at a town hall where he's basically talking about the Uyghurs out of you know China, it's kind of a social norm thing. You're going, huh, that's that's not what we were expecting. Uh, yeah, and I know I know I'm hard on Biden, but it, it, it is it is just so in your face. It's hard not to notice this stuff, especially when it's clear 100 days, no deportations. Then February 19th, here we are. Start sending them back. In fact, not just the people who come over like starting tomorrow. Go back to November 1st of last year. Go round up all those people as well. And you're going, all right. You know, he got a lot of people who voted for him because of some of his immigration proposals. Those are now being reversed in your face. And we'll see, we'll see what that does for his administration moving forward. Because I think, you, you know, every time this happens, you just continue to sort of shatter the foundation of trust that you've built with your base. And that's going to continue to happen. I think that is largely a consequence of any campaign and any politician who gets elected to any position. They are going to moderate. But stuff like this is just very cut and dry. And people are certainly noticing.